This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Mosaic, a daily news program from Link TV, presents a selection of news reports from independent and state-controlled broadcasters from throughout the Middle East. Several people were injured in the Gaza Strip of the Palestinian territories due to a new incursion by the Israeli occupation forces. In turn, the Aqsa Martyrs Brigade took responsibility for firing 20 rockets at the Israeli town of Sderot in northern Gaza. The brigade said that this was part of what they called Gaza's Fall Operation. بانتظار ساعة الصفر لعملية أوسع ظلت السياسة الإسرائيلية على While waiting for the right time to carry out a large scale operation, Israel continues its unrelenting policy against the Gaza Strip. They have intensified their air attacks over Gaza and their bulldozers continue to infiltrate the border. This is what happened around Gaza's international airport at Rafah's border crossing and in Beit Hanun, leaving behind several injured. Twenty injuries came to the Ministry of Health hospitals from the northern and southern districts. Also more than 33 people were murdered in Gaza's districts in October alone. The northern part of Gaza witnessed what looked like a heated chase between men launching rockets and the Israeli army. Israeli aircrafts pursued them, firing several rockets, but the Al-Aqsa Brigade said that its two groups escaped unharmed. In response to the Israeli attacks, the Aqsa Brigades launched what they called the Gaza Fall Operation, launching hundreds of rockets. The Gaza fall operation is a reflection of the resistance inside Gaza. There is a fall season in the United States and in Damascus, so we are using it to speak about the reality of the Palestinians and the resistance, and it is our right to speak. In the Aqsa Martyrs Brigade, we consider the Gaza fall operation a response to the continuous Zionist massacres of our Palestinian people, which has been ongoing for several weeks now. The Israeli army distributed pictures which they claim show Palestinians launching rockets from inside a school. The Palestinians consider these pictures an Israeli attempt to justify targeting schools and humanitarian institutions. It is clear that the Israeli occupation is looking for a reason to target Palestinian civilians, students, and the educational system as a whole. They did this before when they committed several murders using the same tactics, and now they are making things up again to justify their attacks. We warned the occupation against massacring our students and those in the educational system of Palestine. Aside from the war of words and pictures, the facts on the ground show that Gaza will continue to be a stage for clashes and conflicts. As for the duration of these clashes, that all depends on Israel's resolve, based on the outcome of negotiations and relations between the two Palestinian sides. The municipality of Han Yunus in southern Gaza is extremely concerned that the city is facing an environmental catastrophe if heavy rains fall during the winter season. Hundreds of homes in Han Yunus may be flooded with water from the sewage system. 
The residents of Khan Yunis city dreamed of their sewage system being completed one day. The project started two years ago with Japanese funds, but Tokyo stopped its financial aid to the Palestinians after Hamas won the parliamentary elections. Most of the sewage system project was completed, except for 2,500 meters of pipeline, which were supposed to link the Sofa water plant with the location where the water treatment center was supposed to be built. However, due to Israeli closures and international boycott, no sewage pipelines were allowed to enter Gaza, not to mention that Tokyo stopped financing the project. The pipeline that was supposed to link the pumping station near the European hospital and the proposed sewage treatment center has not been completed yet. Israel has not allowed the pipelines that are needed to complete the project into Gaza. In addition, the contractors in the municipality do not have the proper equipment. The municipality of Khan Yunis is extremely worried that if heavy rains should fall in the winter, the city will face a catastrophe. Gaza residents transformed the rain drainage system into a sewage system since they did not have a sewage system. This happened in Gaza during a time when there was no accountability. What complicated matters worse is that the citizens of Gaza linked their sewage water with the incomplete sewage system, thus forcing the municipality to link the sewage system with the water drainage system. This increased the water level of the reservoir lake to a level that is higher than the water water drainage system. If more rain falls, the polluted water will drain back into the lowest areas of the city. Winter is approaching. Sewage water will mix with rainwater in Al Arashia because it is the lowest area in Han Yunus. Unfortunately, residents of Al Arashia are waiting for a catastrophe they do not need. The municipality of Khan Yunis is warning that a true catastrophe may take place in the city if the current situation does not change. This is a real danger. Every area that is lower than the street level will drown. If heavy rain falls, homes, farms and lands will drown. The rain drainage system and the sewage system are already full. The Palestinian citizens are facing both the occupation and the risk of flooding, and they cannot do anything to change this reality. Citizens in Khan Yunis have found a short-term remedy for their sewage water and knowing that hundreds of homes may drown if this winter brings heavy rain. Saad al Din Askul, Al Aqsa Channel, Khan Yunis, Palestine. Iraqi schools are suffering from several problems, including lack of attendance due to difficulties facing students to reach their schools. A girls-only high school in the green area of western Baghdad tells a unique story in this regard. Security officials, however, say that the security situation has improved during the past few months and that the Iraqi government has exerted efforts to bring stability to the area. The history of Iraq shows that it was the land where the first alphabet was written. However, today education in Iraq faces various difficulties, which have negative consequences on the students and teachers. The main obstacle facing education in Iraq is the lack of security, which has been a problem since 2003. The security situation in the green area of western Baghdad supposedly has improved over the past few months, where the government continuously worked to re-establish stability. Despite all this, students of the girls-only high school in the green area still face a difficult situation. However, they have demonstrated their ability to face these difficulties. They have proved that they have the desire to seek out a good education so that they can achieve their goals. They are a great example of how having a strong will can allow people to gain an education despite difficulties. They have always received the respect of the Iraqi society, but they have a problem getting to their school. 
This has made it difficult for them to attend school on a regular basis, which disrupts their educational process. مواصلة الدوام ويربك العملية التربوية. طبعاً يعني هسا إحنا قبل كنا بال بيتنا بالعمرية كانت المنطقة مفتوحة. Before we were able to go to school by bus, but now the area is closed. This forces us to walk from Alameda to the green area. We do not know when cars will be allowed to pass, which makes it very hard for us to go to school. How can we go to school in winter? It will be raining and the roads will be muddy. This will make it very hard on us. Educator Amal Ibrahim expressed a different view. She said that the number of students has increased compared to last year. Last year there were a lot of absences by both female students and teachers. Now many students are attending school. This is due to the fact that the security situation has improved. Thanks to God, the situation is almost stable. American occupation forces and the Iraqi government said that they have taken the necessary measures to protect the students, such as increasing the security presence in all of the areas. The overall situation uh... Overall, the situation is improving as a result of the hard work the Iraqi police have been doing. The police developed relationships with residents which helped the government to establish order. The Iraqi government now controls areas that were under the control of militias. The educational system in Iraq has a great history, despite all of the political instability. Iraq had one of the best educational systems among all the Arab and Muslim countries. The school curriculum was strong and good in all Iraqi schools, but today schools are suffering from many problems, including difficulties faced by students to get to their schools, despite all of the security plans which the Iraqi government has implemented. Iraqi students, however, still have hope that they can maintain their pre-war advanced education. Iraqi Prime Minister Nur al-Maliki said that the relationship between his government and Saudi Arabia is improving, despite tensions in the past. He said that the relationship between the two countries had been sabotaged by some groups in Iraq and Saudi Arabia, and added that these groups failed because the Saudi king was determined to resolve the Iraqi crisis. Since the beginning, I have wanted to send a message to the Arab countries. This is why I decided to visit the Arab countries. I went to the Arab country that showed the greatest level of attention to Iraq. I had to choose between Egypt and Saudi Arabia. I chose Saudi Arabia because it invited me first and honored my request to visit Riyadh. During my visit to Saudi Arabia, I said that we wanted to be a part of the region. The Arab region? The Arab region. I met with the king, and the man was wise in his understanding of the message that I delivered to him. I still have respect for him, and I acknowledge his wisdom. The latest results of his efforts is the religious decree issued by the Grand Mufti of Saudi Arabia, in which he declared that collecting money for those who kill others is an Islamic. I believe that the king played a large role in this. When I previously criticized the Saudis, I was absolutely not referring to the Saudi government, because it is on our side against terrorism. This includes His Highness the King, the Crown Prince, and the Honorable Ministers.
The six major world powers met in the British capital of London to discuss Iran's nuclear program and to debate a new set of sanctions against Tehran if it persists with its uranium enrichment program. This intentional warning was met with a proposal from the Gulf countries, which could present the first step in resolving the conflict between Iran and the West. Ismat Tarabai reports. This meeting in London is similar to the previous one held at the end of September, except for small variations in the faces and the content. Taking the place of Condoleezza Rice at this meeting of world powers is her Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs. He carries with him a new set of tough sanctions against Iran, which could overcome the Chinese and Russian resistance to tougher sanctions. There are two Chapter 7 resolutions included in the sanctions being implemented, as well as sanctions implemented by 180 countries. And there will be a third Security Council resolution if Iran does not adhere to conditions set by the UN Security Council. This U.S. threat comes after its implementation of a host of economic sanctions against Iran. This suggests that the U.S. is not taking into consideration the assessment of the International Atomic Energy Agency, the IAEA. Iran recently met with the IAEA to answer questions concerning its program, and both Tehran and the IAEA were satisfied with the meeting. The results of the meeting will be presented by Mohammed al baradei by the middle of next month. But it seems Washington is not taking any of this into consideration when implementing sanctions. Nevertheless, Ahmadinejad is not deterred by the sanctions. On the contrary, they are simply making his tone harsher and his threats greater. Ahmadinejad warned that the implementation of these new sanctions is a trap for the international community. This alarming course of events urged Saudi Arabia and its Gulf allies to intervene to try to deter possible repercussions. They presented a proposal to Iran to build a uranium-rich plant, which they would supply with reactor fuel, without U.S. involvement. This suggestion could impede the arms race in the region, but it will be difficult to end the standoff between Iran and Washington, at least for the time being. During Mauritania's attempt at implementing its newly born democracy, major political parties held a festival in the capital of Nouakchott calling on the government to resign due to its failure to resolve the country's problems. The head of the Mauritanian opposition, Ahmed Wildada, asked the government of President Zain Wild Zaydan to resign if unable to resolve the economic, social and political problems distressing the people since the formation of the new government. The Mauritanian opposition goes out to the streets expressing its anger at the government. This was a normal occurrence in the time of the former president, Ould Altaya, in which the opposition and the government could never communicate. And it seems that the situation today is the same, in spite of ongoing meetings between the opposition and the current presidential cabinet. They do not combat corruption, nor do they cut ties with Israel, nor do they preserve the interests of Mauritania, nor do they protect the citizens, nor do they lower prices. Mauritania faces a new majority political party, as well as a rise in prices, unemployment, bankruptcy, the liquidation of major state companies, and the spread of corruption and drugs. The opposition regards these issues as an embodiment of the current government's failures. The government always blames the problems on external causes and claims that they are beyond its control. Why beyond its control? It needs to work on reform. The opposition even went further during the festival by saying that the current Mauritanian government is no different than its predecessor. The government has not taken any steps towards fighting corruption and the corruptors. On the contrary, what we see today is a repetition of old patterns, re-establishing the relationship between the corruptors and their enablers in the government. However, the Mauritanian president said that the achievements of his six-month administration are contrary to the claims of the opposition. Contrary to what was said, the economic situation is improving and the government's treasury is intact. By the end of September, the state budget rose to over 2 billion awgayas. 
Who are we to believe, the government that provides us with its numbers and statistics, or the opposition that tells us, like its predecessor, the current government fabricates this data? It seems that the marriage between the Mauritanian government and the political opposition was short-lived. The opposition paints a grim picture of the country's situation, while the government presents the exact opposite. Brahmadar program, this is Mohammed Abdel Rahman Mohammed Fall, Abu Dhabi, Nouakchott. The charity claims it was rescuing the children who were fleeing war-ravaged Darfur in neighboring Sudan. Our correspondent Mohamed Val went to the border town of Tine to uncover the plight of families still living there. We were following a lead that we could meet some families of the abducted Darfur children. Our destination was the border town of Tine, over 400 kilometers northwest of Al Fashir, the capital of North Darfur. A big surprise was awaiting us. This is the Sudanese part of Tine, a ghost town now that used to be a bustling commercial center. Right behind me is the valley of Wadi Hawar, marking the borderline between Sudan and Chad. Over there on the Chadian side, tens of thousands of Sudanese have sought refuge and are now living under the harshest conditions. Looking for a semblance of life almost in vain, we toured the ruins of a town that only five years ago had a population of thousands. We found out that no single soul remained in it after the war broke out in 2003. Residents mostly fled to Chad or scattered in the country, seeking safe havens. A few months ago, a dozen or so people began to trickle back through barbed wire and border guards. No one is sure how many are now back home. Probably no more than 60 people. The marketplace is a de facto garrison for the Sudanese army. Nearly every single item sold here is smuggled from Chad. Sudanese and African Union troops are the only clients for the few merchants who decided to defy the odds. Halima is one of these merchants. A grandmother of a polio crippled girl, she had made the journey to the refugee camps in Chad. The misery there forced her to return to Darfur, leaving most of her family members behind. She showed us the ruins of her house and said her dream is to make enough money to take her granddaughter to Al Fashir for treatment. If a foreign organization offered to take your child away for treatment or feeding, would you accept? Yes, sure. If you knew they wouldn't bring her back forever. Then I won't let her go with them. My grandchild, she's like my soul. None of the families whose children were taken by the French NGO is living on the Sudanese side of Tine. But Halima's case highlights the plight of thousands of Darfur refugees who lost their children either to war or to malnutrition and disease. The lack of basic needs in the refugee camps in Chad forced mothers like this to cross on food with their babies in search of medical care at African Union camps in Darfur. Like Halima, Jamila too is ready to part with her child if anyone offers to take the infant away for treatment and nourishment. But for them never to return, that is a different story. It's a different story as well for the thousands of children who are neither in the camps nor cared for by NGOs. They are left to roam the streets to fend for themselves. Mohamed Val, Al Jazeera, from Tine on the Sudanese Chadian border. U.S. Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice designates the rebel Kurdistan Workers' Party, or PKK, a common enemy. America assists the Kurds in Iraq and opposes the ones in Turkey. Why the double standard? And will Turkey invade northern Iraq? Answers to these questions and more on Link TV's Mosaic Intelligence Report. U.S. Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice says the United States, Turkey and Iraq will jointly counter Kurdish rebels launching attacks inside Turkey from their bases in northern Iraq. 
Rice designated the Rebel Kurdistan Workers' Party or PKK a common enemy and warned against any action that could destabilize the situation in northern Iraq. Uh, that the United States uh, considers the PKK a terrorist organization and indeed that we have a common enemy, that we must find uh, ways to take effective action uh, so that Turkey will not suffer. The U.S. Secretary of State is seeking to dissuade Ankara from a military intervention in northern Iraq where PKK rebels operate. Turkish troops have been engaged in cross-border raids targeting the PKK since October 21st when a group of rebels who Ankara says infiltrated from northern Iraq ambushed a military unit, killing 12 soldiers and capturing eight. The current situation brings to mind a film I watched a few years ago called Good Kurds, Bad Kurds, which highlights the double standard of Washington, which assists the Kurds in Iraq and opposes the ones in Turkey. This scenario is repeating itself, except that this time, Turkey has amassed more than 100,000 of its troops on Iraq's northern border and is threatening a military incursion to strike at the PKK bases unless Baghdad and Washington make good on promises to crack down on the rebels. This action will destabilize the only relatively calm region in Iraq, something the United States has not anticipated. <laughs> We are against war. However, if we are under attack, then we must defend ourselves. Frankly, Turkey is using the PKK issue as a pretext. Every time we make advances in Kurdistan, Turkey creates a problem in order to derail our efforts, and not the PKK. Will Turkey invade northern Iraq? I doubt it. Ankara's ultimate nightmare is an independent Kurdish state in northern Iraq, a virtual certainty after the incorporation of oil-rich Kirkuk through a referendum which should be held next month. Turkey fears that this could spur the aspirations of its own estimated 20% Kurd minority. Thus, many analysts believe that this show of muscle by Turkey is intended to send a message to both the Iraqi government and the U.S. that it is not willing to tolerate an independent Kurdish state in Iraq. Meanwhile, according to Rusen Katir, a Turkish expert on Kurdish affairs, the PKK is hoping to internationalize the Kurdish issue by sucking Turkey into northern Iraq. Will the U.S. and Turkey be able to eliminate the PKK? Probably not. The Turks tried twice in 1995 and 1997 with 50,000 troops and met with zero success. Not even Alexander the Great was able to dislodge Kurdish warriors from the mountains. I'm Jamal Dajani for the Mosaic Intelligence Report. To learn more about this program or to share your thoughts, visit us at linktv.org slash mosaic. Hi again. Just a short while ago, we came to you asking for your help to keep Mosaic on the air. We needed to raise $200,000, and I'm happy to announce that we did it. No, as a matter of fact, you did it. More than 1,600 of you helped us to reach our goal, and I want to thank you on behalf of the Mosaic team right here at Link TV for your support. Stay informed, keep watching, and thank you again. One nation, many voices. The stories of Muslims in America. At work, at play, having fun. What is life like for the millions of people in this country who practice Islam? Finally, I looked in my heart. So I know he can't Even today, Muslims still no way. kind of in limbo. Now's your chance to share stories of Muslims in America in our One Nation, Many Voices online film contest. We're awarding $50,000 in cash prizes divided among six categories comedy, drama, documentary, animation or music, a special category for filmmakers 18 and under, plus films under 60 seconds long. You don't have to be a Muslim to enter or to vote for your favorite films online. You just have to live in the United States. The deadline for entries is November 25, 2007, so hurry. Check out details at linktv.org slash one nation. One nation, many voices. Muslims in America. Stories, not stereotypes.
Get more news about the Middle East online at linktv.org slash mosaic. The Mosaic webpage offers a complete archive of Mosaic programs, program transcripts, the Mosaic video podcast, and the Mosaic Intelligence Report, a weekly analysis of the hottest stories from the Middle East. The views expressed on Mosaic are those of the participating broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible with the support of viewers like you. Thank you. This program was brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. television network devoted to global and national news with uncompromising documentaries and diverse cultural programs programs which connect you to the world.